afternoon. Welcome. Thanks, Jane. Good afternoon. Welcome to an incident starting Health and Wellbeing Board and our special meeting today. We've got a busy agenda and um, we must have had a premonition because we did send a warning that we might extend till five, not knowing that we would spend half an hour trying to get on. Um, please may I remind everyone to mute unless you're addressing an item and raise your virtual hands if you wish to speak at any point. I'll refer to Jane from Governance if I need to recall to vote or for any procedural matters. So first we'll move on to apologies. Jane, do we have any apologies? Yes, Chair, we have received apologies from Mel Thwaites, Simon Down, Mark Powell, Louise Platt and Fiona Myers. Thank you. But John Edwards is, is joining us, isn't he? Yeah, I'm just checking to make say, sure. He, is that John? Yeah. Oh, it's in the link, Jane. I've just sent him the link to email me. Thank you very much, Faye. Thank you. Um, excellent. So do we have any, we'll move on to um, item two, do we have any declarations of interest? I can't see me, thank you. Uh, three petitions, deputations and questions. Jane, have we received any petitions, deputations or questions? Yes, Chair, we have received one question with notice from Mr. Godfrey Jennings. And the questions with notice have been added to the website and circulated to committee members in advance of the meeting. As per procedure rule 93, the total time allowed for each question, including the response will be five minutes. And the questioner may ask one supplementary question for the purpose of clarifying the response. Every question shall be put and answered without discussion and no discussion shall be permitted with reference to any question or reply to a question. I shall now promote Mr Jennings into the meeting. Thanks, Jane. Good afternoon, Mr Jennings. Can you hear and see us? Uh, sorry, I can. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Jennings. Can you uh, can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, th oh, thanks very much for your time. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, members of uh, read members of the committee have read read the uh, the, the question. Uh, so I'm not going to just read it read it out. Uh, unless I'm required to. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid you are, Mr. Jones. I'm afraid you have to read it out kind of word for word um, well, and then we will give a response to it. Um, it, it very steeped in procedure, I'm afraid, the questions and deputations, but I'm afraid. So if you okay. would go ahead and, and read your question. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the implementation plan as presented, uh, presented to the Adults and Health Scrutiny Committee on the 17th of February 2022 uh, is nothing more than a list of aspirations. It is notable that no reference is made about the future of uh, RMH, the Memorial Hospital, or any possible equivalent facility, which appears to be an anonymous harbinger for Rutland, given the government's objective of seeking to place more non-acute care closer to patients. The outputs expected from the current plan are ill-defined and typically within unspecified timescales and with no associated financial budget. Responsibility for delivery is also not clearly defined. It follows that it's not possible for either councillors or residents to assess progress or outcomes against a properly detailed plan. The absence of necessary detail in the Rutland plan stands in stark contrast to the submissions of Leicester, Leicester City and Leicestershire. Uh, why then should Rutland residents have any confidence that when the plan is submitted for review by the ICS, it will be afforded the same degree of consideration of health priorities as that given to Leicester and Leicestershire? Thank you very much for your question, Mr Jennings. Um, 
you and others have made reference to the delivery plan at Leicester City. Um, and just can I confirm, um, before I give my full reply, that you're referring to the plan that was published ahead of their postponed January board, or whether you're referring to a different plan? No, I'm referring to that plan. You are referring to that plan, thank you. Um, so I can confirm that we've looked at plans from across the country to see examples of, of plans. And it's worth pointing out that the city updating updated their existing strategy, however, we chose to rewrite. That being said, their delivery plan encompasses 16 pages of details, but they too do not give specific timeframes or finer detail on measurable outcomes. Our delivery plan, as included here today, stretches to 41 pages and does include overlining details of the lead, the funding and indic indicative timescales, some elements are still unknown, as it is a developing plan. I can draw your attention to 4.2.2 and 4.2.3 in the plan, which specifically talk of work around Rutland Memorial Hospital and the delivery of services within our community. I will finish by giving you reassurance that under the integrated system, care system, Rutland is a place in its own right and will be given the same consideration as the other two places in the system. Indeed, partners around the table do share that view. Now, um, you can come back with a supplementary question. I will also say that there'll be a fuller written reply attached to the minutes and sent to you after the meeting. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, as a supplementary uh, point, um, I think it would be helpful to uh, residents if we had some clarity about the future of Rutland Memorial Hospital, particularly with regard uh, to the provisions in the context of UHL reconfiguration, uh, bearing in mind that uh, there will be uh, more difficult transport issues, uh, especially for vulnerable elderly uh, um, people without uh, tra transport. Uh, and that is, I think, a major concern or one of the uh, concerns uh, associated with that would be uh, ensuring that uh, certain provisions uh, remain in Rutland. Thank you, Mr Jennings. Um, we will, I'm sure during the discussion today, things will become clearer and you'll have some answer to that. Um, and I can say that shared within points of the plan are exactly that and transport and things will be covered. But hopefully, hopefully that you'll have more reassurance today. If you do have any follow-up questions, then we would love to hear them. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jane. Do we have any other questions? I know we have had a late question, haven't we? Yes, Chair, we've had one short notice from Mrs. Susan Pickwode. Um, she is not with us at the moment, um, so what I will do is I will put her question in the minute with a written response and publish and send out to everybody. Thank you, Jane. Um, for um, other members of the, of the board, it, it did come through very late. If, if they haven't seen it, again, it was regarding Rutland Memorial Hospital and the services um, within the community which I'm sure will come later in our discussion anyway, and we'll feed into that answer. Thank you. So moving on, sorry, that was question submitted at short notice. I, I snuck in, didn't I, Jane? Sorry. Uh, next would be questions with notice from members. Do we have any, Jane? See, Chair. Thank you. And... So then we will move to our substantive item on this special meeting, which is the joint and health, health and wellbeing strategy and place led delivery plan. I will just make a note and apology. Oh no, I haven't shot the email down. Um, just to give um, a slight amendment on our decision recommendations, which I'll just go through before uh, John introduces the item. Um, I asked for some clarity from our monitoring officer. Um, as some people are aware, since the expiration of the local authorities and police and crime panels, coronavirus, flexibility of local authority and police and crime panel meetings, regulations from last year, once, um, once those ended, um, we have to make decision-making meetings, in, take them in person. 
um, Health and Wellbeing Boards are a formal committee of the council charged with promoting greater integration and partnership between bodies. Um, they, we do have a statutory duty and um, uh, number three of reviewing and endorsing the plan does fall under the decision making um, part of this that the monitoring officer has advised that we take recommendations one, two and four. Um, we can we can vote on those. Um, recommendation three, which is the adoption of the new strategy, we can discuss in detail today. Um, however, we will need to uh, defer ratification of it until our April meeting, which I'm afraid everyone will mean a jolly trip to Rutland for everyone, because unfortunately we'll, we will need to hold that in person. Um, we will also, there are some changes around the terms of reference to the board, which I'll come on to later. Um, so we will do all of that in one go at, at, at an in-person meeting, which will be quite a milestone because I don't think we've all met since February. Uh, it feels like February 1920, doesn't it? But it, it, it was, I think it was February back before it all began was the last time we were all together, if I remember rightly, in the rugby club doing our very first, it seems fitting because it, that was our first meeting over this plan where we had that working day all together and then the world went very strange to us all. So I will now ask John to introduce the strategy for us, please, and the delivery plan. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm not going to spend hours going through this. I'm not going to be reading through the paper. I'm not going to be reading through the plan. There's many pages, so I will take it as read. Uh, that you've read it, um, that is. So this is our joint plan. It's a and strategy. It's an evolving document. It needs to be a dynamic document and it will continue to be a working document. Um, as has just been highlighted to us, uh, for example, from Mr. Chen's uh, question, um, this is running alongside the UHL reconfiguration. So. As that progresses, this will need to uh, progress as we await the news on RMH or however that pans out. As that progresses, this will need to progress, hence the, the need for it to stay um, dynamic. It's had a tremendous amount of uh, work put into it, and I'd like to thank everybody um, for that, um, all the staff and indeed the public. We've had consultation, we've had subgroups and, uh, and still this is a continuing um, piece of work. Only yesterday, for example, um, I met with some very interested stakeholders and will ensure that their viewpoint is fed into this. And that is something that we do need to continue doing because our population's voice must be heard in this. And this needs to evolve for Rutland as a place. And we must underline that Rutland is a place. And I understand that, you know, People are concerned, well, nest of this and city that, and we're little old Rutland, but that gives us so many opportunities. And we, if we get this right, we can have something very special in Rutland. And we've already proven that we can work so well together as a health and care um, cooperative, if you wish, and how we want to develop that. We work so closely, our care services, our health services, um, and we need to continue and we have a good foundation to build on. So on that, I must shut up or I might go off my soapbox. On that, I'd like to open it up, Chair, with your permission for comments, uh, any questions and indeed suggestions. Thank you. I think, um, shall, we, um, shall we start with... Um... Sorry, that was the iPad falling off. Um, the... We'll start with, we start with the actual um, strategy first, I think, and then um, we can have a quick chat about the consultation and then we can go on to the delivery plan, if that's okay. So shall we open it up for comments on the, uh, on the actual strategy, if any partners have any comments on the strategy? Councillor Wilby. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> I'm probably the last member to join um, this uh, august body. Um, but uh, over the, the last uh, eight years or so, 
I have uh, seen lots of really good work um, from all our partners um, in, uh, in this work, um, from the children's and from the adult side. I've heard lots of uh, detractors. I've heard lots of negativity. But I have to say, when I read the paper that you put before us, between you, um, I was really pleased. I thought this is a good document. It's a broad document. And as John says, it is one which is not a tablet of stone. It is one which we must add to as we go on. And I think it sets all the signposts for us to do the work and to fill in the blanks, to actually put in some metrics of performance, etc. as we go through. But I think it's a, a damn good uh, start, starter for 10. And uh, you are all to be congratulated. And I know we're very fortunate to have John Morley, who is an innovator. And uh, I think people also need to realize that through this, people like Mike and all of you have been fighting a pandemic for the last two years, which has disrupted considerably all the work around. So um, all I can say as a basic medical layman is well done and onwards and upwards. Thank you very much, Councillor Wilby. Sarah, would you like to come in? Thank you. Um, I, ju I just wanted to say as well, I think this is a really good document. Um, and quite comprehensive, actually, particularly, I think, in the delivery plan, which I think is 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 great and well done for those people that have put it together. But I just wanted to give some reassurance over the question that was posed by the member of the public at the beginning of the meeting, actually, in relation to the work we're, we're, we have started as part of the delivery plan around finalising that plan for Rutland in terms of what are we going to deliver locally, etc. So that is definitely on our agenda. We started that work. Um, and it will involve what are we going to deliver um, at the Memorial Hospital um, or, or locally. Um, and also um, we'll have um, a line of sight to the work, um, the acute reconfiguration work, because that's important. And it was part of the um, output from the consultation that we did that as part of this work. So I just wanted to give some reassurance to the committee in relation to those things. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, your hand was up and then it vanished again. Do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, it was just, it was just, and I don't know whether now the one whether you wanted to talk about it now or whether you wanted to talk about it moving forward. But I suppose what I just wanted to highlight was a point around it. We've come to a really great place in Rutland. We've got a really clear vision and we've got a really clear delivery plan around how we can really improve health and care and health and well-being across across Rutland for the next five years. And I think that's fantastic. But the proof is in the pudding. And I think the thing for me now is around how we then transform into developing our vision and um, our delivery plan and moving that forward into really tangible implementation so that, you know, the local residents can really see what it is that we're, we're at, we've committed to do and, and see the improvements that we're that we're doing in that. Um, so I didn't know whether you wanted me to, to sort of update now, Chair, or whether you want to do it later in terms of what we're proposing in terms of how we move that forward. So it's up to you. I don't know how you wanted to play it. No, that I think I think actually it would be um, a good time for you to to do that, Viv, and then we can um, partners can come in with their thoughts on that. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, so, so yeah, so in so in terms of the strategy, you will see that there have been some some changes in terms of the strategy, and, and I know we'll come on to that in terms of the consultation. Um, and we have got a high level delivery plan, which is one of the appendices that um, many of you will have, have had a, had good. Um, input and um, review today um, but what we're really keen to do is think around how we evolve the work of this board um, to really make sure that we're connecting with those local residents but also that we're showing that accountability and delivery and performance so um, what you will see is an appendix D and um, you've got an outcomes framework sort of report and sort of a dashboard now again that will be an evolving um, piece of work and um, this is almost a starter for 10 in terms of making sure that we've got really key matrix um, and a really clear dashboard to demonstrate where we are now and how we can move forward and um, moving forward into the plan. Thank you. 
And we've talked quite a lot around having smart um, objectives, so making sure they're you know they're specific, measurable, accurate, timely, all those all those things. Um, and and I think some people will, will want to see some more detail around that. And and it was just really to provide assurance that this is the start of the journey. Um, we haven't necessarily put in. Um, the very specifics around some of those details yet, because actually we want to make sure that partners are buying into those and, and agreeing those collectively. So it may be, um, you know, that we we want to, you know, aspire to meet the dementia diagnosis rate for Rutland by X time. But what we don't want to do is set up um, set up targets and objectives that actually are not going to bring people with us and, and be, you know, supportively um, challenging, but actually also achievable as well. So um, that work will evolve over time and, and you will see that coming through the board and, and becoming a regular part of the board. And so as part of that, we're looking at doing a quarterly update to the Health and Wellbeing Board and having our senior responsible officers for each of the priority areas and then also having nominated leads on our integration delivery group um, to make sure that we have got that clear line of sight and that, and that clear accountability. We've also talked about some work of, of, um, of the evolution of Health and Wellbeing Board and I'm assuming that we'll probably come on to that. Um, in a little bit later, but I think it's just to reassure that we, we know that there's more work that we can do in terms of evolving the approach of the board um, and the prioritisation of the agenda, but also looking at um, what our um, constituent groups are, are delivering in terms of terms of reference, but also thinking around what subgroups we have. So thinking in um, with Councillor Willoughby's um, Children and Young People's Partnership, and how we link into the Young Peoples and Partnership Plan and really making those connections so that we're all um, joining up together. So I think that's probably my, the key thing to me, unless there's any questions on it. Thank you very much, Beth. Does anyone else want to come in? Everyone's gone very quiet on us. Does everyone, um, is, is everyone sh um, kind of on board with that mic you wanted to come in? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a question for now or another time, but I suppose it, coming back to the RMH question as raised, I mean, it, it, you know, grateful for everything that Viv's done, and actually that reporting and the clear lines of accountability that we've got leads that will report in is absolutely correct. I'm not quite certain. Some of me wants to say decisions about estate almost lie outside the broad principles and partnership working of the, of the strategy. And so I don't, um, so, the, so there's that point, which is actually, what you know what the strategy says and what the reporting lines are absolutely spot on and i still don't quite know as a health and well-being board where what to some extent is more kind of an organizational decision if you like would then feed in because i don't see that as being something that the leads as identified by viv would feed it in so i've i've probably still got a kind of puzzled thought in my mind about where we would put those more organization specific um lines of communication into the strategy and the plan did you want to come back on that or are you i can do if that's okay yeah yes please chair and um, so i think i think there's something that we've we've talked about and we touched on it in in the covering paper around develop, developing a sort of do sponsor watch approach to the health and well-being board um now some of that will allow us to prioritize what airtime we're giving to the health and well-being board to those really important issues for them. and so we know that care closer to home, what we're doing for the Memorial Hospital are really important issues to the local population. So those are things that, you know, I think discussion, future discussions at the Health and Wellbeing Board, as, as those discussions progress, will, will be helpful. But then there is specific pieces of work that you're absolutely right, that are very much delivered by one organisation, but will have an impact on Rutland. And some of those areas of work might come into more of a sponsor area of work, which um, is linked into the board, but maybe not on a, not on as much of a regular basis. Or there might be watch areas, um, which actually we know are going on over here, and that we would just pull them into the Health and Wellbeing Board when we know there's a particular issue that the board needs to have a conversation around in terms of implications. So if we talk about um, you know, UHL reconfiguration, that's an incredibly important issue um, to Rutland. Um, a lot of that work will be led by UHL, but actually when there are key, you know, milestones, that's when the board might want to bring that conversation into the board to make sure that the Rutland voice is being really heard and, and acknowledged. So I think there's something around, around using that do sponsor watch approach, but then there's also something for me around um, really thinking around everyone's role around the table of the health and wellbeing board 
and really developing that cultural and human rights approach around the health and wellbeing board because actually sitting at this meeting today will do a tremendous amount but actually that's not going to implement the strategy and it is about how um, partners take away um, sort of asks and discussions and recommendations from this board back to their own organisations to get that organisational um, approval as needed to then hopefully bring that to the table at a future meeting to be able to move some of those really wicked issues forward. So I suppose it's, it's a bit of a balance for me in terms of difference in approach of the board, but also everyone acknowledging, you know, what their, their role is around the table and actually that we're doing more outside of the, of the board than actually sitting around the table today. Thanks, Viv. Uh, Dr. Fox. Yeah, just really to, to build on, on Viv has been saying, one of our main concerns is about health inequalities. And we know that the major health inequality for people living in Rutland is the difference in the distance it is to an acute hospital, with only 7% of people living within 30 minutes of an acute of a, of a hospital as opposed to a national 30%. And that, that is um, a significant health inequality. So the distance and the services provided in Rutland are not simply the preferences of our population. They are our means of dealing with what is a major health inequality for our population. Um, and I think that that should be covered off in, in where, where that is a priority in the plan. And that should be um, underpinning our review of, of what's happening at RMH and what services are, are being provided at RMH and elsewhere in the health estate in in Rutland, we should have underpinning that, um, that we are trying to address a health inequality, um, not, um, not respond simply to the preferences of our population who have simply highlighted this health, health inequality that we know exists. Does anyone want to come in on that or? I can do this helpful, Jay. So I think I think that there's some really valid points that um, Dr. Fox has raised there, and I think it's just to provide reassurance, really, that um, you know we are absolutely hearing, um, and we absolutely are, are very much aware around those health inequalities for Rutland that are very specific for Rutland. And um, one of the actions that we have got in the um, delivery plan is around doing a health needs assessment, specifically looking at the specific health inequalities around Rutland, and as part of that one of those pieces of work will be looking at access to services and um, you know what the patient flows are, what the barriers are, whether that's a transport and a, and a, um, and a rurality issue or whether that's um, a digital inclusion issue or whether that's actually that the, the two um, services are not talking to each other and actually you know um, patient data is falling through the gaps. Um, so, so just to reassure you that um, we're, we're absolutely clear that that's a real priority um, as part of the strategy in terms of ensuring we're getting equitable access so that comes into that sort of priority four area um, but we just want to make sure that we're getting the right evidence base um, to then have to then go out and collectively work with our, our neighbouring integrated care system and local authorities to see how we can overcome some of those barriers. Thank you Viv and I, I do know that um, included in that is is really important points around rural transport issues as well um, so that they, I heard um, today, and, and I know it's a fact that if somebody, um, say in Ketton, um, needs to go to Empingham surgery to collect a prescription, that involves a three and a half hour round trip on public transport going out of county to come back in because there isn't direct buses. Um, and so to expect um, an elderly resident to um, take three and a half hours to collect a prescription seems rather daft when it's only five miles away but actually that's the reality to a lot of people our our bus network is um we know isn't very timely but also it it doesn't go from a to b it tends to go to um e and f and sometimes z to come back to b so um there there is that that point needs taken into account very much so as well uh janet would you like to come in Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to highlight another potential inequality that is uh, there waiting to happen if it isn't already happening. And I understand from reading both the strategy and the plan that the healthcare systems across the ICS boundaries are not going to be able to 
talk to each other digitally until um, 2026-27. And, you know, I have spoken to you about this. Um, what I'm wondering is whether there could be any mitigations put in place to circumvent the, um, the uh, lack of um, digital communications uh, for patients who are resident in Rutland but go across the boundary to say Peterborough for their health care. Sandra. Thank you. I, I was going to say there's certainly, we can't make promises or guarantees, but there's certainly potential to enrich the dialogue that we're having with other facilities such as uh, Peterborough City Hospital around um, sharing access to online systems where that might actually support us in that follow through. So that's definitely a, you know, there are there is scope for potential local solutions, even where the national national systems haven't caught up. What I also do want to say is that we, we put a date of, um, I think it was 25, 26 against um, wider integration than our sort of, you know, that the shared care record is coming for local integration. We actually don't know that time scale. And it may be that that actually is achievable sooner, uh, but we didn't want to set unrealistic expectations because that's really a national set of developments, but we're certainly pushing as fast as we can to get the shared care record into place and maturing because that's, that's, that's our precondition to start to um, look outside of our own area and and see what um what exchange we can get going more broadly so um, we're pushing very hard on that and um you're absolutely right let's be creative I, th I think as well um there's something to be said for communication in a way and and i know uh, probably some members of the public either listening or or out in our wider community will think it's a bit daft that um, in, in all the IT world that we're living now, that um, one, one, if you're at a doctor's surgery, say in Empingham, that it doesn't talk to our hospital in Peterborough. Now we know the, un, and understand the reasons for that. And um, we know the separate systems, but actually for, for uh, Mrs. Smith in the street, um, it, it, it sometimes doesn't make much sense. And so there, there, there can sometimes some, be something to be said about explaining why we can't do it and why it's not so simple because actually if there's an understanding around that um, uh, and around how the dip the complexities of a national IT system and all these separate systems that people are talking to and especially around data protection and around the the fact that that patients um, very carefully kept medical records are on these systems so everything has to be super secure that actually that in itself can, can be a lot and maybe one thing the board can can move forward on on these really complex issues is around the communication of them how are we explaining ourselves to our residents and how how are we keeping them up to date with what's happening so maybe that's something that um i know we'll come on later into another bit around um about moving the board forward and, and our april meeting and subgroups but um maybe that's something for our communication uh, communications around that, that that would kind of make that a bit clearer. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? No, it doesn't appear so. The one there was a a, a couple of points I had, and I don't know. I'll open it up on the um, on the actual um, delivery plan. Um, the one thing that maybe I would, there is a lot of detail in here, and um, I think for us, it's um, it's quite clear. I don't think it's quite so clear to the members of the public who um, don't live and breathe all our different strategies that we all um, have some understanding of how they all fit in together. Um, the one thing I maybe would like to see with us moving forward is, um, and I'll see what other members think on our if we look at our do things so things that the health and well-being board have we've said that we might well look after um we have who the leads are um we have um roughly where the funding is going um and on that proviso I will kind of remind people that every we all have our 
at the moment everyone has their separate pots and the funding comes from separate budgets within separate organizations um, so we don't have business plans for um, currently all our or everything that runs out of us now um, we have our indicative timescales and where it's been held and then we have our metrics um, and the one thing i'd like to maybe see moving forward is um, put in some more specifics onto our metrics so um, in some of these we need to make a bit of a journey and what I'd like to see is the, some of the stepping stones in that journey and some me, on a measurable time frame. So this is where we are now. Where are we moving to? Um, I don't know. I'll open that up and I don't know what others think, whether that's a good idea. I think that there are some journeys that we need to take within this. And um, I think we need to be showing where we are so that we can measure against it so that as a board, we can actually then start, start seeing that. So. I'll open that up and I don't know what others think of that. Viv. Thanks, Chair. I mean, I certainly think that's something that we can continue to do and, and evolve. And, and I think that again links into understanding who the leads of the specific projects so that we make sure that those stepping stones are the right stepping stones. Um, and I think it also links into how we will be providing that regular performance report because there would be some things that we can have very tangible um, you know measurements around in terms of you know we're going to increase x or we're going to reduce y um, but there will be other things that will, will be sort of less less tangible in terms of a particular outcome it might be an output so it might be for example we're going to have um, you know a needs assessment on understanding what really good end of life looks like for Rutland. Um, so that's not necessarily going to change um, the um, portion of people that are living, dying at home straight away, but what it will do is provide the evidence base to then decide what we're going to do in terms of those next steps. So I think as we work through the detail in terms of those particular do areas, I think some of that will come out and will evolve. Um, and I think this is how, where we can link into making sure we've got real accountability and, and particular leads for those areas. And then making sure that those conversations are filtering up so that how well being board are absolutely clear in terms of what progress has been made within that quarter. Um, and then so that they can help and block and challenge and support moving the progress forward. And um, really, um, for me, it's really about how we as a collective can unblock some of those issues that we're struggling with and people feeling supported to be able to bring those to this board to make sure that we move them to move them forward um, in a collective and supportive way, I suppose. Thanks. Does anyone else have any comments? Jenna? Thank you. I've got I've got a couple of things um, relating to the plan. Is that okay to bring in here? Yeah. Um, the first thing is that I I think it's probably in light of COVID, it's probably pertinent to have something within the plan um, to permit dealing with unexpected but immediate situations um, in case we have another pandemic or another crisis of some kind. Um, and secondly, um, I have noticed that when I've been going to CCG meetings, there's uh, training and development is going ever higher up the agenda as we've got a, a staff shortage, the shortage of professionals and the emphasis is on staff training and development, but I think it's more than that. I think it's about um, capturing the uh, school leavers into the professions as well and offering training places for people. So I'd like to see training and development, training being emphasized as much as staff development and looking after the workforce, if that's possible. Sorry, that's a bit jumbled up, but that's... <laughs> Does anyone have anything? Mike? It's an interesting one, isn't it? The sort of role of the Health and Wellbeing Board in an emergency situation. So um, part of me would say, but well, it is an interesting one, because I suppose it went all the way through having to publish local outbreak management plans. We had to set up a... Um, whatever it was called, an engagement board, which we did at LLR. And then, of course, you've got the role of the, the local resilience forum for, for Les City Lesher in Rutland. Uh, again, nothing's written down. Part of me would reflect on the kind of history of the last two years and go, 
actually, when we produced or were told to produce local outbreak management plans, we didn't really need to set up a separate member engagement board. Engagement directly with lead members and with the leader is important. But actually, the Health and Wellbeing Board was probably a ready-made partner, multi-agency partner agency at a place level to bring together a load of people to say this is what we're doing around COVID more generally and um, and enlist their, their support. So a sort of musing really, because it's not really been within the role of a health and wellbeing board, and I don't know how far we can push the boundaries, but it would be tempting to find a role as a multi-agency partnership at a place level for the health and wellbeing board to at least be a kind of coming together um, forum when we are faced with a health health infectious disease emergency I need to be careful about a health emergency it could be any kind of like Opal level four um, within UHL or other providers but um, maybe, maybe it's one to think on I can't quite get the, the words right but it seems a shame not to waste the opportunity of having everybody in the room not to work out what's the strategic direction for x kind of incident within Rutland. On a similar kind of note, would there be, um, and, and maybe not, so this is a question for you, Mike, would it be, um, would I be right in thinking that when, in, and if the world returns to some sort of normality and um, there will be some sort of um, kind of, I suppose, like, look at what we did, what went well, what didn't work so well, some sort of... Um, kind of review into everything and maybe that would then give some learning if if that makes sense so it's, uh, I suppose like a case review but not a case review yeah I mean there will be the public inquiry obviously um and there could be any review that we want to um it's it, yes yes there will be I guess the thing for me is I'm not certain if the people involved would really understand what a health and well-being board could do because they tend to they tend to, people who lead these inquiries tend to see life in their own their own particular way which is a bit more kind of top down um so yeah I, I wouldn't rule it out but I still think there's something about just us thinking through locally how might we get a better grip on some of the health protection measures which in times past we'd have gone that's just the work of PHE and then UKHSA and, and nothing to do with the Health and Wellbeing Board, really actually what we found is, it is. Yeah, that might be worth mm. having a think on. Does anyone else have any thoughts on it? Don, you're being very quiet. Yeah, no, um, I, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think as we review the role of the Health and Wellbeing Board, which we've started doing, um, that we want it to form the main governance feature of place. And going back to the previous um, point, your point, Sam, actually, um, we need to tell the story through this plan, where we are now, where we want to be. And that depends and also brings in any uh, um, um, crises and it will be good to develop this board like that so with what Mike just said I um, I agree I think again it's an opportunity for Rutland you know to actually do something like this because we are all around the table anyway Thanks. does anyone else have any um, comments on the strategy the plan where we are where we want to be I can't see any hands. No. Biff. No, thank you, Roger. I suppose for me, my question would be around um, how do we collectively as partners make this strategy come to life? And I suppose it, it is around thinking around um, would it be helpful to look at um, some development sessions or some sort of working together around how we can bring people together to develop those relationships to, to really address that um, consolidating a sort of systems approach to delivery of the work. Um, and it was just whether that people feel that there'll be an appetite in that. I mean, we've talked about work that we'll be doing in terms of looking at the terms of reference of the Health and Wellbeing Board, looking at how we can 
evolve um, the children and young families partnership and, and support that. Also looking at the integration delivery group and also and then thinking around what are the gaps we've got. So we have talked around um, how the board can um, evolve its um, relationship with our local population. And we have talked about a communication and engagement strategy. Um, so that we will be having much more um, regular dialogue with our population and making sure that you know the voice is really intrinsically heard and and filtered through the delivery of the plan um, but I suppose it's just around um, how what partners would find helpful in terms of supporting that approach and um, if there's anything we need to be aware of in terms of when we're doing that development work that we can link in with them um, so we can hopefully bring a bit of a proposal for the next housing wellbeing board in terms of how we might move that forward. Thanks, Vic. Does anyone want to come in? Yeah. Yeah, just to say that I really think it's very, very important to keep the public informed and involved and take them on this journey uh, that we're all on, as, as Viv has suggested. Thank you. To um, uh, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And, and yes, we'd always support anything that that um, develops a health and wellbeing board and place-based working within Rutland. I guess I'd like to think we start from a, a better place than maybe Leicester or Leicester City because, you know, we are smaller and we do know each other and there's been lots of good integration work um, before. But anything that um, builds that team spirit sounds fine. I guess the, the point for me is uh, again, and maybe it's a development session rather than a, for a public meeting, is almost understanding exactly where the um, where the lines are in terms of what we could do that would be Rutland specific. So every organisation has got their spending decisions, their hierarchy, their governance. So there's something about building the culture of working together, which is fine. But then almost trying to really solve that sense of how does, because I think when you said system working, to my mind, that's system working at place, which I know is torturous, but there's how do we make this Rutland system work with the system that is LLR and finding a bit of space for a small number of people in a smaller area to try and really unpick how those two things clash and can work together better would be really useful. Because I suspect the answer is that we can crack that one. We, we've cracked the ICS, but nationally, thinking about all those debates about member representation on the ICB and all that kind of stuff, I'm still not quite certain if nationally there's an answer to that. So. Uh, it's possibly a big ask that I'm setting you, Viv, if you're up for it, but any kind of development session that isn't just about taking forward the the, the linear lines of the strategy and is actually how do we get Rutland as a place singing, which isn't just about culture, but is about decision making and budgets and budgetary flexibility and everything else would be really good. That does bring in one other thing that I've um, kind of been thinking um, and I did discuss with um, John and and that is around our JSNA, which partners will know um, does need updating. And obviously, we um, the census results are out in April, I think. Someone I'll, I'll look for a nod from someone. I'm pretty sure it is April first published, and then July for full results. I think is the time frame uh, COVID allowed. Um, what um, the what? What I was thinking, and I've been looking, researching best practice nationally and looking at what what's, um, what seems to work really well, what's easy to read, because obviously a JSNA also um, has to um, make sense to our residents and things. It's not just um, kind of for, for us. And one thing um, I did like the sum, we know that ours, all of our chapters need reviewing. Um, there's been some law changes, there's been other things have come in. So we, we do need to go through and update every single chapter of ours. But then it, 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 it was kind of, I, I was trying to reflect and think, well, actually, what can we do as a board to, to keep it relevant and to, um, to review it regularly. Um, and one thing, and this might fit into what you've just said, Mike, in some ways, one thing I was thinking was um, maybe uh, if we renewed, um, renewed it annually as a group, um, and um, it would be kind of a standalone document with the separate chapters. And we all know how difficult um, it is to renew something or review something if you're emailing around separate chapters. It takes weeks of people's lives and also there has to be someone coordinating all that sending around, which again becomes months of someone's work and they suddenly become big things. But actually, one thing we might look at 
is to do an annual review day of the JSNA where we all come together. Um, so I don't know what people would think about that to have um, one day a year where we set um, a period of time to actually moving forward, then review the JSNA once it's once it's kind of up and running fully and up to date post COVID. So I don't know what others think of that, Viv. Thank you. I mean, I think I think having um, some dedicated time to collectively come together and review progress, I think, is really positive. Um, one of the things that I'd be really keen to do is it's sort of twofold, really. One is to think around how we evolve um, the JSNA to become more of a live document in terms of um, acknowledging there will be specific chapters. So it might be around health and quality, it might be around dementia, it might be around. Um, military personnel it might you know there, there's there's certain particular chapters that i know that we're, we're sort of thinking about already and um, but i'm also really keen to think around how we develop the jason into that wider population health management approach so there is almost one clear um data set that everybody knows that's where the latest data will be on rutland um so that's the, one of the things that i've been certainly talking around in terms of with our sort of analytical support around how we can have that regularly updated um, sort of dashboard approach so that you know if you want to look for the latest population estimates you know that you're all using the same figure and that sort of thing so so there'll be something for me around that about how we can make sure that we keep it as live as possible and as up to date as possible um building on that population health management approach but then the other thing for me would be around on this annual review day actually i think what would be really good is to review yes some of the jsna data but also do an annual review on progress of the joint health and well-being strategy um, so that we can then build that into an annual report that can then be, you know, we were talking about doing that, so that would be published as part of the board's work on an annual basis, but it would be good to bring partners together to have those discussions around what's worked, what hasn't, where, where our progress has done well and where it hasn't, and then also what we can collectively do to make recommendations for the next year and almost help support that, then um, what would the delivery plan be for the following year, um, so if we could borrow, add anything into that, I think that would be really helpful. Thanks, Viv. What do our health colleagues think? Um, Dr. Fuss, do you think that would be a good idea and worthy? Or yes, I, I think I think that would I think having a live document and a dashboard, you know, pro providing recent data and, and a single set of data will be really useful um, to just to monitor actually what we're achieving in terms of the, the plan. Thank you. Yes, yeah, one thing it's one thing I've I've kind of realized and um in in a lot, in a lot of things I look at, the um, we're perceived to be very healthy. We're perceived to be very affluent. We're perceived every everyone has perceptions of Rutland, and actually, we know that the data suggests that that's not. Well, we know on the ground that that's not the case. And and actually, um, I think having analytical support and having a dashboard in one place where it will bring out some of these inequalities and actually make it easier for all of our organisations. To kind of um, highlight them, which I think is would would work really well. Um, I don't know whether Faye or Sarah, you want to come in on any of this, or whether you feel it, it's. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in. I think it's a good idea, actually. I think the, the idea of having a day where we review the GSNA and the progress we've made with the strategy, I think, is really really a good way of managing it going forward. Um, what I think we need to do, though, is when we come to renew the, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. We really should have renewed the JSNA before we've done the strategy, but um, we'll probably need just to review the strategy once we've got the JSNA results, just to make sure that there isn't anything that we've obviously missed in setting the strategy out. So I think that we need to build that looping at some point this year as well. But Thanks, yeah, I think, it's a good, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Faye, did you want to come in? Can do. I'm certainly in favour of the dashboard approach. It's uh, I chaired the integration delivery groups for both, um, uh, well, I'm involved in the city one and the chair of the Leicestershire one, and that's really been helpful, actually, certainly through the pandemic and um, seeing the impact on some of the services and how they interface with each other. So I think, you know, having that sort of dynamic document will be really helpful and insightful for us. Brilliant. Thanks, Faye. Does anyone else have any comments? Sorry, looking around the looking around the table. No. 
Does anyone else have anything else to add then on the delivery plan? No. So what we have to do, sorry, I've got the wrong bit of paper. I've got 100 bits of paper. So if we take the recommendations, what we, um, as a committee, we need to note the context and purpose of the strategy. We need to note the report detailing the outcomes of the consultation. And then we need to authorise um, the director of social care and public health in con consultation with myself who oversee work to further refine the delivery plan leading up to the strategy launch, working with local stakeholders. So do we need to, to have a vote on that, Jane? Or can we do a nod? Um, if you want to do a vote, that would be very helpful. We shall do a, help, a vote to help you out then. So um, uh, if I propose it, would I have a second, please? Thanks, John. And um, can we have a raise of hands if everyone's in support of those three recommendations? Thank you. I think that's everyone, Jane. Yep, thank you. Thank you. And then um, our item three was to review and endorse the Joint Health Strategy and its associated delivery plan. Um, we, I recommend that we defer that item to our April meeting, but in the meantime, we work on it to further develop it so that what I hope when we come back together in April, we'll have more of um, some targets, we'll have all, more of our finer detail um, moving forward so that everyone, um, we've got more of a picture of our where of our journey and where we're going. Is, is everyone happy with that? And can I have a seconder for the deferment of that um thanks john and then again can we have a raise of hands for everyone at who on the board in favor of that thank you thank you very much right thank you everyone we'll now move to Sorry, bear with me, I've put my papers down again, I apologies. So we're sorry, now... Uh, Viv has a hand Sorry up. Viv, you've got your sorry. hand Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Jay. It was just, um, I just wanted to just um, double check what we wanted to do around um, recommendation five, which had just slipped off the, the bottom of the page. <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry. Thank you, Viv. Thank you. Yeah, so sorry, um, five was to approve the proposed um, evolution of the Health and Wellbeing Board, including adopting the do, sponsor and watch approach, which we all felt was good. So um, if we have a quick show of hands that we're in agreement of that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Viv, thank you very much for reminding me that it's a page. Um, so next we have an update to step up to great mental health um, from John Edwards. It is on the delivery plan. We will probably be touching on is it, uh, chapter seven. It is chapter seven. So if I could uh, pass to you, John, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I think... Um... Obviously, in terms of updating the board, I guess we'll get into a pattern of that to fit in with the new structure that you're talking to. And um, and the update will be more in tune with the specific uh, delivery plan. Um, what I'll talk to you a little bit about is, because um, this was a follow up from the last occasion I was with you, which was last meeting actually, to go through the feedback of the consultation. Um, and it was just to do a, a brief update on what next, really, um, and the further conversations that's been taking place, um, uh, really to get an early insight from you, whether that feels directionally satisfactory for you and in, in keeping with the discussion that's largely just happened, actually, about how you're shaping up, um, delivering against all of the all of the health and wellbeing plan. So, um, uh, I won't recap the consultation because hopefully members remember that, but in effect, 
it was a, a large scale consultation um, that engaged around a range of changes to mental health services. And um, uh, it's been an interesting um, period of time, disrupted somewhat with the uh, response to Omicron, but we've organized implementation into um, a couple of steps, really. Um, the first of those steps um, we're looking to run till the end of June, which is setting out a series of sort of immediate um, uh, priority areas to focus on, which um, if uh, if the board is happy, I can share a draft of that um, for information after this meeting so people can have sight of that. Um, and the idea is to try and create a bit of headroom to get ourselves better organized to be implementing this in the way that we want to and that we've agreed to, which is in a very much um, a deliberate co-design and uh, a much more localized way than perhaps historically we've gone about stuff. Um, so um, across to the end of June, the intent is to um, do a range of things. One is, as I say, deliver against those those first quarter priorities or first quarter 22, 23 priorities. Um, and um, alongside it, um, we've, we've been trying to rethink the governance around the programme of work, which hopefully fits with the conversation which has just been taking place. So um, for Rutland, the intent is to shift the balance away from a kind of system top down implementation to actually the uh, shift in the governance around mental health around um, an effect place based delivery boards um, that has a support of a system wide group. So if you notice the dynamic shift there, so rather than a system board dictating what things should be taken down and that then sort of devolves to place to implement is going the other way. So it's trying to make sure that we're setting clear priorities informed by what we have to do across the system, which includes what's largely in the health and wellbeing plan for Rutland as well. Um, but is driven through the place. And then it has the aid of system-wide group to support things that needs to be coordinated across the system because it makes sense to, or can be better enabled through, through system. So it's trying to shift that governance. So um, we've, we've been working with system partners um, uh, to try and draft that governance. There is a there's draft document that's, that's gonna hopefully be into um, be finally tweaked this week. And then the idea is to go out and engage, make sure that that fits for you um, as well as all the other partners and, and feels like that's going to be the right answer to the exam question. I know from our engagement, uh, Councillor Harvey and with John as well, that seemed to fit uh, largely the model that we were, that we were heading to here. So, um, so the idea would be then to, um, alongside trying to agree that new governance approach um, will be then building together um, a complete transformation plan that's organized around place, which is which is extending the detail to the existing health and wellbeing plan that we've just been looking at um, and um, and the stuff that links into the system wide, uh, which will be largely the same thing or a combination of the three places, uh, but there might be a few things on top of that. Um, the idea is that we try and build that and I hope try try out these new governance structure uh, over the next uh, few months in draft form and through some development sessions so that we can actually um, uh, really get to tune with the mental health agenda at, at, in, within Rutland, make sure that we really do understand exactly what we're trying to deliver here um, and start modeling the right behaviors of partnership working and all the rest of it that we're going to need to have to to shift what's been quite, it will be quite a cultural shift for some of the uh, service partners. So, so that's what we want to try and do in, in step in the first step towards uh, implementation and then the, the next step will then be formalizing that new approach um, and uh, and working through the plan in, in accordance with the, the um, do stop do watch sponsor approach if I get that in the right order Viv apologies if I did not um, the general approach that we want to take in in, in methodology uh, uh, forgive me if this is too much detail but um, uh, but it's relevant because we've committed as part of this consultation to co-design and co-design in a way that I guess we've not really done at the scale we're, we're intending to. So it's just like working with voluntary sector organizations in their role to engage further within local communities and really try and engage 
genuinely local communities in in as much of this as we can. Um, we had through the consultation work with about 40 different voluntary sector organisations to support that consultation and it, it went very well. Um, we've been continuing to try and work with those organisations and have an event next week with them to help get their support to try and support with these these first quarter priorities and try and do the co-design work and get used to doing that in, in practice. Um, the methodology you want to take forward then is to have projects that get set up and that could be projects that are organized around place or system um, and then quality improvement cycles that get built within local areas and the co-design would happen very much uh, in both of those places but particularly in the quality improvement cycles because the project will only be setting a schema a, a broad uh, sense of principles and structure to the work but the actual change will be designed very locally through those those improvement cycles which should increase the likelihood that we are delivering things that actually work for Rutland, that are actually around that population, that are actually going to work for that population, because all the partners and that local insight will have been will have been done at it through that quality improvement cycle. So that's that's our approach. That will be described to you in some of those documents. So so uh, I recognise I'm talking to you, and you're probably retaining some of what I'm saying, and maybe a lot more not. Um, but um, uh, that's broadly where we are. I can I can brief finally brief you on a few things that are happening now, just for your general uh, um, updates. Um, so um, we have issued out grants. We put out uh, just over a million pounds worth of grants that was across Leicester, Leicestershire, and Rutland, um, uh, and we have a, a, a range of bidders. Um, not a massive amount from Rutland, although there is some. Um, and that will be taking, uh, being reviewed in panels um, in March, early March, uh, with a view of awarding within March um, and deploying that. So I hope that will increase some voluntary sector provision within Rutland. Um, we also included uh, a separate grant scheme for having crisis cafes. Um, uh, I need to get an up-to-date position on how many bidders came from Rutland. I think it wasn't I don't think there was that much, so I think that will be a point of reflection if we haven't managed to get a, uh, a bidder from Rutland area, because we might need to work together on thinking about how we can increase the likelihood of doing it. This is not a one-off opportunity, by the way. There will be several cycles of, um, of grants that will be put out. Um, we have agreed and facilitated money coming to Rutland Council to, um, to create a new neighbourhood leadership. Um, and this will be dedicated role to then uh, be a point person to help coordinate the mental health changes within Rutland um, and start to be a point person to really can help bring bring partners together, keep the energy going. And as Dr. Fox will, will, will know that we've got lots of ambition. We just need a bit of capacity to try and put that into place. And I think that this gives us an opportunity to create that um, that capacity and headroom to actually keep going. Uh, and if, hopefully if we do get a board in place in Rutland, they will be instrumental to keep that informed as well, I think. Um, um, and uh, we also invested in um, uh, a range of additional social care um, roles, including within Rutland. That's been facilitated through County Council, um, actually. Um, but one aspect of what they'll be doing is trying to introduce what's called the three conversation approach. Um, uh, and, and we are keen, um, uh, which just needs to be worked up with colleagues within Rutland to see if this can work for us. But um, uh, we are keen to, to see Rutland as an innovation site, uh, which will be having a kind of um, dedicated improvement cycle. Um, and uh, not to go into all the detail what free conversation approach is, but it, it will be an approach that helps to bring partners together to work together very locally. So it'll work on developing how they work and interact together on a common aim um, around mental health uh, using a particular approach. So, so that would be quite exciting and another way of binding us together and, and seeing that partnership working uh, flourish. Um, so there's a, a sort of brief overview of uh, things to date. Thanks so much, John. Um, I'll open it up to questions. Dawn, you have your hand up. Thanks, Sam, um, and thanks, John, for that. Um, just a couple of questions from my perspective, and I'll apologise that if I've missed this in um, any previous um, meetings, but um, 
in terms of the place-based delivery group, is that that you've described, um, I'm assuming it's an all age place-based delivery group. Um, so obviously covers children and young people. It's not just an adults focused group. That will be, that's what we're proposing. So this is, this will be a proposal to be shaped. So, um, uh, cause I think it's really important that people have the time to really think it through, but yeah, the intent is to make sure that this is all age. And, and will children and young people be um, involved when you talk about co-design? Um, does that include including children and people in co-design? It will need to. I think that, mm. like always, is uh, this is this is this is uh, this is a journey for all of us. I think and to achieve that well. Um, but yeah, I think the whole point is that we're it's a full commitment that we need to go about how we design things with the people that need it. So we need to figure out the best way of involving children, young people in that as well. Obviously, on the areas that are particularly interested in. But yeah. And then finally, final question. Um, just you just mentioned um, neighbourhood leadership post um, yeah. around mental health, yeah. um, and one of the, I'm particularly interested in what what that is covers what it actually will do, but particularly because um, obviously not just Rutland, it, it'll be across the country, but we're developing our family hub um, programme. And so it feels as if there's a really clear link for that particular role or person um, in terms of um, linking that in with our family hub um, development, which is part of priority one, but it obviously crosses with priority seven in terms of our um, delivery plan and strategy. So, um, I'd be really interested in kind of um, working up a little bit more about what that looks like and, and kind of how we can really link um, that in in terms of that children and families um, link in terms of family hub too. That'd be brilliant. If you're linking with Emma Jane uh, within the Rutland Council, cause she'll be particularly instrumental in starting to get that role into place. So that might be a really good way of uh, connecting that early doors. What's the name of the role? Just so I'm, I'm writing down the actual... <laughs> well, well, I don't know if it's changed in translation because these things do, but I believe it's uh, um, a mental health neighbourhood lead at the moment, but it might okay, change. That's what I've yeah. written down. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, Sandra, you were next, I think. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of really exciting work going on and there's good momentum there. It's sounding really good. Um, as we start to form those groups across our programme to drive forward the different areas, it feels like you're certainly further ahead in terms of your, even though you feel you feel like you're not, in terms of your um, co-design approach, for example, and it would be really valuable, really helpful, I think, that we have some cross-fertilisation across those groups around things like that, because I think it is a bit of a, a bit of a departure. And um, I think we would benefit from making sure that, that, that those groups are really connecting together well. So obviously we've got the integrated delivery group as well as, as, as a means of maybe getting together to more operational level. But um, I think there's there's huge opportunity there. It may be that- Great question, uh, but- uh, Well, it may be that we need to create some development session, don't we, to, mm -hmm. to share learning about how this, because, you know, I, I think we, we're trying. I think we've got an intent. We've set out our stall, as it were. We've committed mm -hmm. to this. We've yeah. got a, we've got some experience around a consultation. It's going to be quite different when we run into implementation. And so, um, and co-design. Because I've, I've tried to do this for quite a long time in very mixed <laughs> experience uh, of having some people involved in work and so forth. And it, uh, we are trying to do this genuinely to try and get a very local insight because we've learned through the consultation. It is. I mean, it is so variable and, and Rutland's fascinating, actually, you know, and some of the feedback that came from Rutland and particularly the rurality and some of the experience of farmers as well. Um, some really quite surprising feedback, as in and not to not to draw too much at this meeting, but, you know, of, of farmers just genuinely not being able to access services because they work and um, and really feeling isolated and needing yeah. or feeling like they need something, not sure what they need but they mm. miss a the trust of service but b it doesn't it just doesn't work for them so you, so we have to model it mm. around them you know um uh, and that isn't if, if you don't know their experience you won't do it you'll just try and offer it in office hours and and then they won't use it so um so we've i think 
yes, I think that's why this is important. But yeah, I'm happy to mm -hmm. to continue to share. And maybe if we uh, in a few months time when we've got something a bit more to talk to in terms of how this is starting to play through, that might be a good mm -hmm. time to, to look at it together. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, John. Mike. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So, John, you know, you talked about the community grant scheme, the million pound across LL and R. Um, don't have to go into sort of too much detail about the panel membership. I'm sort of reminded that a couple of years ago, before COVID, a number of us were involved in a sort of Rutland community health and wellbeing grant scheme. Um, certainly, Citizens Advice Rutland were involved in it, and Karen Kibblewhite from the uh, from the council. It's probably worthwhile. I'm sure some of the things that were discussed then have probably cropped up on your list from Rutland. So um, I'm trying to find a way of sort of bringing a bit of past history and a bit of local knowledge about organisations and viability and the rest of it to, to bear on, on the prioritisation. So as to check that you've got the links in with Rutland more generally, but maybe specifically about some of the history of the grant scheme applications we considered then, so most of which were really about mental health rather than physical. Okay, that would be brilliant. I think um, Rob Melling's my point person on this, Mike. So if there's um, if there's through through Fiona or whoever you feel you could deploy that that insight, that'd be brilliant. It probably it predates Fiona. I'm probably looking at Sandra and hopefully Karen. Well, Karen should have the history and memory. I don't know if Sandra, you could chase that with with her if possible. I can. I think the reality is that much of that was was Trish. To be honest with you, but uh, yeah, it would have been. It? We can see what we um, can do, um, definitely. But oh, if oh. it's if it reassures, we were asked. I think there was a particular application that had come through, and it did come to the council for for a point cool. of view relative to the other things that were were being commissioned. And I think that's very welcome because I think if I can expand just a little bit, um, as we get opportunities for new pots, I think it's really important that we're thinking quite strategically about how we use those resources collectively to really fill the gaps, if you like, in our, in our place plan and make sure that we can drive, it, drive all of its priorities forward. So um, there is something about um, finding a way to, to make all of this make sense in place. Thank you. I don't know whether John and Hilary, you want to speak, you have, your hands went up to speak on this point. No. Hilary, did you want to speak on this point or were you waiting for us? another point. Oh, I just had some questions about mental health access. Oh, I'll just bring Viv in then and go John and then um, and then you, you Dr Fox um, in order. So uh, Viv, do you want to come, come in on, on this? Thanks Chair. Um, it was just really to sort of build on some points that we've, we've talked about and, and thank John for already supporting the Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy because I think getting the mental health elements on the joint health and wellbeing strategy are absolutely critical and really, really important. Um, so I suppose it's just thinking now about how we can link in the governance routes and stuff that you're proposing into the wider work of the health and wellbeing board, just to make sure that, you know, we're looking at physical and mental health on exactly the same parity. Um, so, um, so yes, we can pick that up outside this meeting if that's all right John so I'm really keen to work with you on that um, and then the other thing was just around um, just some of those insights around um, the sort of farming communities and, and rurality and um, if we could link in some of that um, qualitative data into the health inequalities needs assessment that Mitch Harker's leading on that would be really helpful um, but again I can link in outside this meeting to sort of pull those bits together if that's okay. Brilliant. Thanks Viv. Thank you uh, John. Thank you, Chair. We've actually made my point, my point for me that I was about to um, make. So, John, just to thank you for this. And personally, I fully support um, the work you're doing. It's vital that we now start, and I know this is a bit of a cliche, uh, that we start to equalise or parity, the word that Viv just used, um, mental health with physical health. I particularly like the three conversations model. I particularly like that we're we're looking or you're looking at you're looking at a bottom-up um, co-design because that's very much what we've been doing anyway on the physical um, health aspects and it just fits and anything that we can do as a council or indeed as a partnership just shout thanks john dr fox no thank you I, I think it's a tremendous vision of trying to provide a lot more in the community than we have done um it does bring into um, focus that the that we need some sort of premises for 
um, mental health provision in Rutland. Um, we have nowhere at the moment to put um, the IAP service. There's no, there's no physical accommodation for the IAP service. And we know that the patients have, have talked about the distances they have to travel to access specialist mental health. And also that for mental health, they prefer face-to-face. -face. So, so some of the digital solutions aren't necessarily meeting the needs of, of everybody. So I know we've talked about health and wellbeing having a health and wellbeing centre. Um, but I think that would really facilitate this work um, in trying to bring together the, um, the social prescribing team, the mental health teams, and, and, and making something really worthwhile for Rutland. Um, and I just had a second point, which was about the military. Um, we have talked in this group before about uh, including some sort of representation from military primary care, because obviously they're not part of our primary care network. Um, and I wondered whether there was any specific ways that we were addressing the, um, the mental health needs of the military population. Thank you. Does anyone want to come in or are we leaving that bit to me? I think um, I can confirm that um, the military thing, I think, uh, Sandra, we are in talks, aren't we, about um, hopefully in April, um, when we bring the paper um, in April to, we, we are looking at um, further people sitting on the board with us, one of which will be a, veteran, uh, a, a military lead and will um, help join up, because you're right, they have, um, they, they kind of, the veterans have, or the veterans have one um, kind of need and then are serving population and our families have another need so um, having someone that that can share that knowledge with the board will be um, will be great and also will help us with our requirements under the um, armed forces legislation stemming from the covenant so that all kind of feeds in together and um, sorry Dr Fox what was your last your third point was it was where are we going to put them that's it. Thank you. And I'm I'm looking at Dawn, and I know she she took herself off mute. And I I don't know. I think this sits really nicely, possibly around family hubs and around. That yeah, that's sort of what thing. I was going to say. Absolutely. I thought you were, and I was I was looking <laughs> forward to that. But I yeah. actually think this this um this particular knowing that people um, require a safe place to be able to go and sit somewhere where they're not stigmatized where they can feel comfortable actually does lend itself across the board maybe towards the family hub so i think i think having discussions around that um, i think i think you're right absolutely and, and that's exactly what struck me when um, dr fox was um, speaking i think it'll come back to that perennial issue of um, uh, basically place be, uh, building kind of you know and I think that's um but that's something that we can certainly you know in terms of the family hub program we're currently um starting a about to start a feasibility study and whilst that's around what the program will look like it will also include kind of the, the kind of place elements of it so um we've got a really good opportunity to kind of feed in at the right right now yeah, and I, I think John, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I know um, Sarah's just put her hand up as well, but um, John, I don't know whether you want to feed in um, to with Dawn around um, that feasibility study because it it it, make, it it does seem to make sense to have those conversations now and, and have that in. And um, Sarah, did you want to come in on this point as well? Yeah, I think this is also part of the wider discussion around services and, and then, then that leads on to space. So yeah. I think we need to look at A, whether there's a short term opportunity, but B, it also leads into that whole conversation about, you know, what are we doing in terms of services and where will they be in Rookland? So, yeah, it needs to be picked up as part of that as well. Brilliant. Space was the word I was trying to think of when I said place. <laughs> but it was space. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr Underwood. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, two things. One, nobody has mentioned Peppers in Oakham, um, which is a charitable organisation uh, running a sort of a drop-in cafe. 
don't know whether they've got suitable premises that they can rent out. Um, don't know whether they're involved in this scheme, whether they, they're they bidding for funding or anything. Um, I don't even know whether John is aware of Peppers. So that's one thing I just wanted to put on the table. And the second thing actually relates back to the plan and is something that I picked up and meant to, to um, discuss, but here is as is, is good point as any, is um, male mental health. There's been quite a lot in the media about men and their, their mental health issues. Um, and I particularly picked it out with maternity and there's a lot in the plan discussing uh, female postnatal depression, um, but men also suffer with um, their mental health when things like miscarriage, pregnancy, there's a higher instance of um, violence in men towards their partners during pregnancy. Um, did I say miscarriage? When there's miscarriage, postnatal depression for men, a lot of this is coming to the surface. And I think it's something that we actually shouldn't overlook. Thank you, Sandra. Did you want to come in? Yeah, just briefly. This this did come up. Uh, the points were made during the consultation, the dialogue we were having subsequently, and so we have shifted the language into parents rather than mothers, for example, to really be a bit more inclusive around around those really important stories, and also around, for example. Um, the business of bereavement so that we're you know thinking about some very specific um, audiences because they they respond to different different um, forms and, and types of service it's really important so thank you for making that point thank you Does anyone else? Can, can i just ask about yes um i think and john may confirm but i seem to recall from the uh, consultation that Peppers did actually take part in the consultation. Um, I'll let John come in, but I seem to recall they did. Yeah, I do know Peppers there, um, uh, and uh, we had a we had a, a Rutland session actually that that um, Dr. Fox helped uh, organise, uh, which they also involved Peppers. Um, they didn't they didn't actually apply for the Crisis Cafe monies. Um, I don't know the background to that. Um, but I'm curious about it. So I think these are things to be following through with and understanding a bit better. Um, in terms of opportunities for the state, I think that's the whole point of getting people together locally um, because it's the way of resolving these things, isn't it? And seeing you know what the answer to the possible is. And certainly from the initial engagement that we had, that uh, as I say, the Dr. Fox brought people together and we, we had a good network meeting. There's lots of opportunity, actually. Uh, it's just about the keeping momentum with it, I think, as much as anything else. Hen hence, partly having that neighbourhood leadership role to keep keep momentum and starting to see through some of these opportunities as we as they come up. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Yeah, just just on the on the peppers, they were they were aware of the the opportunity for um but they i think they felt that the crisis cafe didn't fit with their current model um and and similarly they, we've looked at space for using the pepper space and they have offered space for certain things but it doesn't fit for everything so they're really involved they, i mean it's a fantastic organization that does a great deal of of good for people and they are really involved but um they have they have a a remit that they define thank you uh Inspector Booth, did you want to come in? I know you're listening in. No, I don't think so. Um, do so. Do we? We seem to have a couple of actions from this little um, part of the discussion. So, um, if we're in agreement, and Jamie, if you can make a note, I think John, you were going to share um, details of the plan to us um, after the meeting, and then. Um, John, you were going to pick up with Dawn as well after the meeting around um, discussions around the family hub and moving forward. Was there any others that I've forgotten? I don't think so. No, was that, was that it? Brilliant. And also Sarah, as, as Sarah said, bringing in also the... Um, space and um, conversations around the, the estates as well. So we've got that. Now, have we got, does anyone else want um, anything to discuss on 
the update on mental health. No, brilliant. Thank you. Right, our last part of the evening, uh, afternoon, evening, um, is the primary care task and finish brief. Um, now, I am very conscious that we've all been sat here for two hours, so I don't know whether everyone just wants a couple of minutes just to step or whether, no, carry on. I think, or is David just waved and gone for two minutes? What does everyone want? Does everyone want just two minutes just for a comfort break? Because I'm very conscious we've been sat here. And to be fair, I am otherwise going to have to disappear and John's going to have to take over for two minutes. So if we could, shall we reconvene at 10 past if that's all right? And um, and we'll just, um, everyone can make a quick drink and stuff. So see you all in at 16.10. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. So uh, agenda item 6B is a briefing from Councillor Paul Ainsley, Chair of the Primary Care Task and Finish Group on the group's preliminary report. report. Councillor Ainsley, over to you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm going to be working on the assumption that um, you've read the report and had a quick scan through the data. There were quite a lot of data, so um, I'm, but I'm willing to answer any questions about that detail. Um, the report presents the data gathered by the group, accompanied by a preliminary report and an outline of the methodology used. Um, we still continue as a group, a task and finish group, to strive to understand the resident's perspective accessing primary care and have at this stage deliberately chosen to present the patient survey responses exactly as written in a raw and undiluted form. And I, I think that was particularly important so that the end user's perspective I try not to use the word patient, it's end user's perspective, actually shines through. Um, we were particularly pleased with the patient engagement with the online questionnaire. And the, obviously the questionnaire has provided a valuable insight into patient experiences. And we received well over 900 responses. And of those, 86% included written comments, I think which demonstrates real involvement. Um, we owe a special debt of gratitude to all of those that participated in our online survey. Uh, we continue to gather information um, and from the PPGs and the only people we've had on at the moment was Market Summerbury due to um, a personal issue. Um, last night we had a group meeting, um, Rajna Vyas, Executive Director of Integration from the CCG, and several of our colleagues attended, as well as Dr. Hilary Fox, um, Primary Care Network. The presentation and subsequent discussion were both interesting and very informative. And I'd like to personally thank all of those that attended. Um, is, as chair, I'd also like to reiterate that the local authority welcomes any opportunity to continue working in close collaboration with all stakeholders to ensure that the voice of our residents is heard. Um, we will be producing a final report that should be coming out uh, mid to late March, hopefully mid. And that will dissect and interpret the responses to the surveys, as well as our consultations with the PPGs, patient participation groups, run the PCN and LLR, CCG. Um, the final report, in addition to reporting the patient's experience, aims to make recommendations on the emerging primary care delivery models and long term infrastructure planning as well as actually looking, having a good look at premises investment uh, or estate investment, because I think that's particularly important. Um, and of interest, and really this is just a general comment, is the fact that actually RCC is actually conducting an asset review as we speak, or I think it's happening very shortly. So when you start to look at premises for other services that you were talking about earlier, it may well be that uh, touching base with that asset review might be particularly useful. Okay, thank you all very much. That was obviously a quick gallop through, but are there any questions that you'd like to ask me directly? Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Does anyone have any questions? Viv. Thank you, Chair. Um, so thanks for, you know, really interesting report and, and really keen to see the full report um, when, when it's ready and available. Um, I suppose my question would be, um, there's some really good and um, tangible examples around um, how patients are experiencing primary care and access issues and things like that, that are really just keen that we make sure that they are completely linked into the joint health and wellbeing strategy and into that delivery plan. And we have got particular priority around access around that. So I suppose there's two things for me. I suppose it's 
in in the sort of next report i'd be really keen to see how we can bring these two things more closely aligned and more closely together to make sure that we're not you know missing missing anything and there but also really keen to um understand your engagement approach um because you've got really good response um in terms of your engagement um, and, and consultation on this and as we've talked about we really want to evolve the consultation and, and sort of engagement and co-production approach for the health and well-being board so if there's anything that you can do in terms of recommendations in terms of how we can um build on some of the work that you've done and that engagement that you've done around wider work around health and well-being board just be really keen to um, consider that and link that in really Thank you. Do you want me to speak to that now, Councillor Hubbard? Yeah. Of course. Thanks. Um, yeah, our engagement strategy was fairly simple, really. We uh, we actually produced a flyer and pushed that through a lot of doors in Rutland. Um, we had, I think it's fairly obvious from results that actually we seem to get more flyers pushed out in Oakham than we did in other areas, particularly as we got further east. Um, we were disappointed that we couldn't actually avoid, we couldn't get engage more with people who were who were um, less IT savvy. Um, we had, everything was done particularly, but we were pleased with the overall results. We did have somebody, uh, one of our less uh, able IT members, who was actually taking phone calls and actually sort of filling in the survey remotely. Um, but I think the biggest thing that made a difference, as far as I'm concerned, was the actual flyers. It, it did actually pushing things through the door. And we went and sat outside supermarkets and we actually got out there and engaged with people on the street. So, and that was useful as well. Although due to the weather, COVID and goodness knows what else, that wasn't as uh, heavily utilised as perhaps it should have been. Um, as for continuing engagement, yeah, absolutely. We are, uh, we think there's quite a, quite a lot of lessons to be learned from the patient data, even though it is raw, uh, that actually could be would seem to me to be exceptionally useful for the uh, for for this this forum. Um, I'd like to make a comment, which is slightly slightly probably a little bit confrontational, but I apologise for that immediately. I there's an awful lot of healthcare professionals around the table today, and I felt that there were some really useful and strong conversations made. But what I felt was a little weak, and this is just a personal perspective, was that actually the um, the patients or I don't know, the, the population that's actually going to be using all these services didn't seem to come across loud and clear. I didn't hear that mentioned particularly often. That could just be because uh, I didn't really listen properly, or it could simply be that actually perhaps we need to make greater efforts, I would suggest, to actually get to make sure that the, the groundswell of feeling actually comes through. That's just an observation. Okay, thank you very much, Vivian. Um, shall I do this bit, Sarah? Do you want to go on your question? No, I'll get it. I'm sorry, sure. it's auto chairs coming in here. Yes, I'm sorry no, about that. No. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. I would also say, Viv, I think as well, one thing um, important about the, the response was the fact that um, people wanted the opportunity to have a say. Mm. Um, so I think it was a very current, um, current issues that people were already having the conversations about and we uh, allowed them the outlet. And I think that really did help. Uh, Sarah, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I think that as well, Councillor Harvey. I think that's one, one of the reasons why you got quite a lot of um, response. And I think you'd find that if we run it in other areas as well, because it's a current topic, isn't it? So, But my, my, there was a couple of points I just wanted to make. So there's a lot of links between this piece of work and the work we've been talking about, as Viv says, in the health and wellbeing strategy, particularly around that access and um, piece that I was talking about, about around future services. So we need to match those th things in. And we also need to take account of the housing growth that is coming in Rutland over the next 10 to 15 years, because if we're planning for the longer term, we need to plan over that period of time. So we know that there's potentially, I know we're redoing the local plan, but there is potentially quite a lot of housing growth in Rutland that we need to take account of. And we will do that as we develop that piece of work. Um, obviously the shorter time scales, you know, within five years is a bit easier to plan on the ground than it is for 15 to 20, but we do need to, to take that into account as we do that. And your point about patient involvement, I think is really key. So we'll make sure we pick that up as we go through. But we would also say that patients have already given us an awful lot of feedback over the last two or three years around services. 
So we will use that intelligence and insight as well as, as we go through that phase. But I think you're right in terms of making sure that patients are, are taken with us or the public's taken with us on this journey in terms of where we get to with um, solutions and proposals. So they were my three points, really. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, Dr Underwood. Could I come back on one of those, those oh, points? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, Councillor Ainsley, of course. Yeah, I think we were lucky with our timing. I, I actually agree with you 100%. Um, and I also, um, I, I do worry about um, the capacity and, and um, estate planning, particularly with the emerging pressures. I mean, the local plan has thrown a bit of a spanner into the works. We don't yeah. have a uh, facility to plan our health facilities and indeed education facilities um, with that in mind. So it, it is a little bit piecemeal. And um, I, we've asked the questions we have asked the questions and um, the fact remains that it's all up in the air, but there are an awful lot of developments coming through around our, our two conurbations up in yeah. Oakham, yeah. uh, and I think yeah. that's particularly relevant. And the yeah. other issue I, I am concerned about um, was actually the amount of care homes that are actually going right. up in Rutland and in particular Oakham. And, I, and although I'm led to believe that that's not going to affect primary care services, I, I have my doubts and uh, and I can't help but feel that um, it is something we need to take into account and yeah I, I, agree. I look at the capacity of the estate and I'm thinking uh, uh, in particular of Oakham Medical Practice yeah you know it's built for 12,000 people it's yeah. got 15,000 of this size yeah. and it's got an estate that is yeah so we have already um we have already started some conversations john and um mark and myself have had conversations about a strategic approach to estates development and i think your point about the asset review is really important as well because we should be looking at this as a public sector assets really as well you know as as well as the assets that are owned by general practice so i think we just we do need to take a holistic approach to this and look at it in the round particularly taking into account the the growth in the primary care workforce, Hillary, I think, over the next few months and years that, that we're likely to see with the additional roles and things coming in. So I think there's a we are starting to work on that piece, but there is a big piece of work around how do you marry service provision with the estate provision and then marry, and then uh, lay on top the potential housing of growth that's going to come in over the next five to 20 years. So can I just come back with one more on that on that particular point, particularly about uh, estate provision, and, and, and that is simply that um, it was brought up last night and been brought up several times before that actually we look to invest section 106 money, SIL money, public money in what is essentially a private business, uh, i.e. for GP practices, and we, I don't know the arrangements of the GP practices, how they were they leasing or who owns them, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. but there is there is definitely a concern uh, raised about several members about that very point, so that's something we will be looking at and, and see what we, you know, what, what the truth of that is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. And just for members of the board, so they're aware, and I know it, it is um, within the plan that we, um, that I have asked um, for a ongoing list of developments. As, as um, colleagues are aware, we, um, planning is, is kind of a hot topic at the moment and we're having lots of applications come through. So I, I am looking at um, having a developed list so that we know where our hotspots are developing. Um, so, sorry, Dr Fox, did you want to come back in on this point or have you got a separate point and I'll let Dr Conley? No, just, just really partly on, on Sarah's point and, and partly on Councillor Ainsley's point. I think um, several of the the gp practices are owned by third parties and leased back you know and effectively rented to the nhs um so i, th I think that's a slightly different issue um and on sarah sarah's point we were we are in a position where we won't be able to take up the additional staff um unless we have somewhere to put them thank you dr fox uh dr Underwood. thank you Yes, I agree. This really shines a light on, on GP access across Rutland. Um, and I think it was very necessary to do. Um, I noticed in the, the sort of introduction that you were look, aiming to look for quick wins. I actually created my own table of statistics so I could compare the performance of each surgery with, with the others. And what I found was that Empingham 
was coming out top in their sort of front of house, telephone answering, offering appointments, etc. And Uppingham was coming out top in their um, care that the public patients thought that their care was good, etc. But alongside all of that, Oakham medical practice was coming out as scoring the lowest in most of almost all but one category. So I'm wondering if a quick win is looking at the good practice, mm. seeing what's working well, and then trying to get that into where there's an underperformance so that eventually we all um, get an improved service with improved care and access. Thank you, Dr. Councillor Ainsley, do you want to come back? Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just going to invite Hilary Fox, Dr. Hilary Fox, to respond to the fact that they are private practices and that actually we did discuss at length, I think, did we not, that um, we would, best practice should be shared uh, amongst the practices, um, but there were significant uh, issues with that. And, and Dr. Hilary Fox, do you want to talk to that or are you quite happy what I've said? Yeah. Um... I think if, if we if we look at the, I, I would say it's a little bit of issue with underperformance. I think there's absolutely a demand and capacity gap. Um, but on the statistics that we've produced for the task and finish group, um, our, all of our practices are performing. There is a, there's a level of access recommended by the King's Fund of 75 per thousand, appointments per thousand patients per week. All of our practices are exceeding that and and doubling that in some cases. In, in the context of Oakham medical practice, they've made a considerable changes over the last few months. And I, I don't know how you reference the survey in terms of when the patient experience was that they're describing, but certainly in the last sort of three to six months in Oakham medical practice, they take, they've taken on a considerable number of additional clinical staff, changed the telephone systems, um, and, and really done quite a lot of work with the, the CCG, which I'm sure Sarah will be able to highlight um, to improve the performance. So. If the experience that people are describing is before that happened, then maybe this survey needs to be repeated at some point to see um, whether they, you know, and, and perhaps you know, referencing to different age groups and so forth, um, to see what what to, to actually find out more detail of, of, of current experience because I, th I think some of these changes have been very recent. Um, for example, in the last month, we've um, worked with DHU to provide an additional. Two hours of face-to-face -face appointments every day, um, and th there are a number of things that have happened very recently. And so, I think it's a really valuable survey in terms of experience. But um, it's taken at a time when general practice has been under immense pressure, and I think we probably need to be looking at it when when we when we get back to a position of sort of business as normal. You want to come back, Councillor Angie, and then I'll just come back. Yeah, yes, please. Yes, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Fox. Um, I, I can confirm that the uh, the survey is, of course, a snapshot, and it was taken at the height of the pandemic, uh, of the Omicron uh, events, and it was actually done between the 9th of December and the 10th of January. So, you know, that's a very limited time, and and I, I, I we fully accept that the practices were under exceptional pressures at those times, but were we felt and what we feel from the data is that this is not uh it's not an issue that's just cropped up as a result of the pandemic this has been this has been rolling on for some considerable time and i'm really pleased to hear that um that have been improvements made to the telephone service in fact anecdotally and i have no evidence to support this you know i was getting feedback that's saying yeah actually we are getting through now so there have been improvements made and i think your your idea of having a second survey is something that should be considered it does depend on what rcc uh and the health and well-being board want to proceed from now but thank you thank you councillor and see i was going to come into that because obviously the task and finish group um such as as the way they they are set up is due to end in april but however um i know with the final report um that we will have sight of um there it, it, there is something to be said maybe the health and well-being board would take this survey and maybe repeat it um, say a year after, so give a year, so uh, repeat it in December um, of 
uh, yeah, we are in this year, aren't we? So December of this year, so a year later, so that it gives time for, for ch changes to bed in and maybe would give us another s snapshot of how, how we were doing. So maybe that's something um, that us as a board would like to take forward um, from a health and wellbeing board perspective, as opposed to the task and finish group, which um, is only scheduled to go on until April. April, I think I'm right, Councillor Ainsley, it was only for six months. Absolutely, and due to the delivery constraints and everything else, it'll actually be mid-March when we're finished. Yeah. We're, there are, um, because then we'll have to circulate and get in touch with, you know, all that stuff before we go back to full council in April. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I, I just want I to make one quick point, if I could. Uh, I think one of the reasons why... I particularly like the comments section within our report, and I particularly within the, the data set, um, because it added so much colour, uh, and I know that upsets people and certainly can be seen to be insulting at times, but I do feel, and it certainly can be challenging, but nonetheless, I do feel that um, the way the questions were phrased, which is actually down to good old Sam in part, I have to give him some, her some credit, um, that actually, it did actually have a whole lot of colour, and I think therefore a lot of strength to the uh, data set. Thank you. Thank you, I'll take that compliment, regardless as it was. Does anyone else have any comments? Um, so I think from the action, would um, am I taking it that the rest of the board um, would very much like to see the final report and um, work it into the strategy? So we'll, we'll, we'll do that as an action. And then I think um, Councillor Ainsley, perhaps, um, and of course, it's not for us or to, to make any recommendations of the task and finish group, but um, there, pro there possibly um, is something um, that the Health and Wellbeing Board would take take on to repeat the survey for you after a set period of time if, if the task and finish group felt that was worthwhile, that that could be a task that we would we would happily carry, take on board. Um, and perhaps it could be repeated um, in a similar method to how we proceeded, which wasn't um, too high by tech. It just took some footfall and some um, uh, nagging of emails and stuff. I do know. Um, so um, I don't know. We either, I'm, I'll look around for some nods if others are in agreement for us to maybe look at, at taking that on and repeating it if we felt it was worthwhile. So. Uh can I just make a quick point? I think the data set is probably useful and might actually, uh, and I think that I, I, I think the committee are well, want to ensure that it's been redacted for some of the doctor's names that were included in some of the patient's comments, which I think it, it has been done. But once we're absolutely certain that um, we're, we're happy to share that if you think it'd be of any use. I think, I think so. It's, it's, the, it's the voice of the Brutlanders um, at a particular time. and. Therefore, it is is a rich voice, and um, so and and you know, it, I think you it, it it is quite fabulous that nine hundred people responded. That is by far the largest response we've had for a long time to to a consultation. So um, now, clearly, clearly, it was a topic of the of the day kind of thing. But equally, it we did do something right with the with the way um, it, the public engaged with it. So um, so that's something. Thank you very much. Did anyone have any other, no other points on that? So we can move on and we will, um, as I said, we'll just do an action, that as an action. Have we got that as an action, Jane? Looking for a nod. Excellent, thank you. Um, that's us. So actually, we've got the date of our next meeting. We come to the end finally. The date of our next meeting is Tuesday the 5th of April at two o'clock. As stated earlier, we do have to be in person so we get to see each other in 3D for the first time in two years. Um, the venue is still to be confirmed at the moment. Am I right, Jane? It, taking into account all manner of things. Yes, I have provisionally booked the council chamber. I am just waiting for confirmation that yes, we can have it. Thank you. And am I right in thinking, well, we need we need, we need it to be in person because we're going to be making decisions. Um, am I right in thinking, is there any way we can, I'm just thinking of some of our health colleagues who may find it easier to zoom in 
if and it on. will be done by zoom as well so so there is like council yeah like council and is there an element that we could have a hybrid meeting so if some of the members of the board were um kind of um caught up in something they could zoom in and still be part of the meeting as opposed to just watching we will take I will that get back to you on that one Thank you. Yeah, if because I think I think it might yeah. be that if we can get some sort of hybrid, because it is quite an important meeting, just with um, for our other colleagues, and we will um, we will kind of send stuff round. Yeah. I'll look into that and get back to you. Thank you very much, Jane. We will be bringing forward a paper on the health and wellbeing board and the governance around it. Um, we the terms of reference. We're doing a constitutional um, review on wider council issues. And one thing that came up was that constitutionally, some of the health and wellbeing board stuff is slightly out of date. So we need to do some housekeeping on our terms of reference and things and our group names. But we thought it would be an ideal time to take the opportunity to look at some of our subgroups and things and so, so that the board starts um, working best for ourselves and also for, for Rutlanders and sits and starts fitting in really well with the place-based plan. So we'll be bringing all that as well. Um, so without further ado then, I will declare the meeting closed at 16.37. Thank you so much everyone for all the um, patients getting through with our Zoom issues earlier on. And I'll see you all in person in April. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye.